Hey everybody, welcome to Shot the Movies. It's time for you to get your freak on with mm, baby. Fuck the hero. Where do I'm we done. go from here? <laughs> Remember when we first met John McClain? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClain kicked out. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question Were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Bubba Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. And at the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, you can subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Watchmen, and we currently are doing Lovecraft Country on HBO. Find all that information or past episodes at ShatOnTV.com. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, Follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel at shatthemovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and end each week with a Shappy Hour cocktail party. I believe this week we're doing Mai Tais, so if you want to get fruity, come get fruity with us. Now, all that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing today? Uh, So the movie we're doing this week fits in perfectly with the time of year i was shocked today i went shopping at our local Publix with emma to get some food and they've got all the halloween decorations out i mean as we're recording this it is september 27th and it feels full-blown halloween i can't believe this year has gone by so quick so with all the halloween stuff up it really made me in the mood this week when one of our listeners, Richard M., commissioned the 1986 Stephen King comedy horror film, Maximum Overdrive. So now usually each week, when somebody commissions a movie, I will respond back and say, hey, you know, thank you very much for the commission. Here's the process. Over the next month or two or whatever the, the time span between the commission and this recording is, leave us a voicemail, write us in. And usually every week, I pretty much go back and there's an email there. This was the first week that I did not have an email. So I was rushed. I wrote, you know, Richard M. I said, Richard, we're recording here. Can you send me something? And this was the email I got back from Richard. Hey, Big D, just got your email. Honestly, really never gave much thought to the movie. I love it because of old trucks and guns. And it's not a great movie by any means. (laughs) I remember seeing it back in the day and have seen it a couple times over the last 20 years or so. I did not expect Gene to be that excited about the reviewing this movie when he responded to that guy asking about Halloween movies. Guess I shouldn't get my hopes up too high. Thanks for kicking ass. As always, Richard M. I just love when two guys can connect dick to dick over email and, you know, get us going. Richard, (laughs) don't be surprised. This movie fucking kicks ass. Like, I, I, I love this movie. And listen, it doesn't have to be a good movie to be a part of your childhood. And and for me, this was a huge part of my childhood. Well, Maximum Overdrive is a 1986 comedy horror film starring Emilio Estevez, written and directed by Stephen King. The screenplay was inspired and loosely based on King's short story, Trucks. (laughs) Maximum Overdrive is King's only directorial effort and rocks out to a mid-80s hard rock soundtrack entirely by ACDC, King's favorite band. ACDC's album, Who Made Who, was released as the Maximum Overdrive soundtrack and includes the best-selling singles, Who Made Who, You Shook Me All Night Long, and Hell's Bells. The film was nominated for two Golden Raspberry Awards, including Worst Director for Stephen King and Worst Actor for Emilio Estevez in 1987. King eventually disowned the film and described it as a, quote, moron movie. 
He considers the process a learning experience after which he intended to never direct again. Mm. Now, Big D, Ash, we always ask with every film, where were you the first time you saw it or what are your memories of this movie? So growing up, I have to admit, I was a Stephen King you know, lover. I loved all of his movies, the bad ones, the good ones. Cujo scared the shit out of me. Uh, Children of the Corn scared me. Firestarter, I thought was pretty good. Pet Cemetery as a kid was good. Carrie, the creep shows were okay. I even paid to go see Graveyard Shift. That one about like a textile mill and the rats. So those were pretty bad. But when this movie came out, it had everything I wanted. There was like aliens. There was some comet. There was some, uh, it was almost like a zombie flick where you were having something overtaken that was going to get survivors to come together and band together and try to make it. So I paid my 350 opening weekend, paid for some other movie, snuck into this theater, and, and I, was, I was happy as could be. So coming into this review, I had nothing but glowing memories of this movie and my experience seeing it. I still wish I could dive back into my seven-year-old brain, like back to my brain in the 80s, like before our brains were polluted by the internet and like information overload, where you just watch it and go like, fuck, that's pretty cool. My my <laughs> older cousin rented this when I was seven years old, and I thought it was the most mind-blowing movie. Fuck it. The most <laughs> mind-blowing concept of all time, like machines coming alive. Yeah. And a as a kid who spent hours playing with matchbox cars and like giving each personality, you know, like each one had a voice and like they did certain things like this one can jump real far and that one can like, you know, jump even farther. OK, they wasn't really creative with it, but they each had a personality <laughs> at least. And I felt like my imagination was being put on screen in a way that was like it was scary but not too scary for a seven-year-old. It was like still silly enough to really like, it was frightening, but not, I didn't want to go hide and cry. And at seven, you never really stop to ask a lot of the, like how the fuck questions. And now mm -hmm. I have those, how the fuck questions when I'm watching this. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, wh how does it even work? And um, I felt myself like preoccupied with that for about an hour and a half. Well, I mean, Stephen King has always been one of my favorites since I was a really, really young kid. I was obsessed with his books and his movies from about about 10 on. Um, I've read pretty much everything that he's ever written, um, including short stories. And I've seen all of the movies. And so thus, I've seen this movie many times, uh, many times before. I actually, though, had forgotten about it. When I saw it on our list, I was like, ah, I've never seen that. And then as soon as the opening scene started, I was like, oh my God, like my dad and I rented this all the time when I was a kid. Um, and then my friends and I, we watched it all the time. And I used to love it. And the premise is it is so stupid. Like it is such a so stupid, stupid so. idea, but it's fucking amazing. It's a it's a fantastic movie. It, it balances that line of of stupid and fun. You, I found myself wanting to shit on it and hate it, but at the same time loving it. This was a really tough movie to watch because mm -hmm. it is so fun, but it is so dumb. All right, well, Big D, let's get to it. Kick it into gear and take us to the trailer. Hi. My name is Stephen King. I've written several motion pictures, but I want to tell you about a movie called Maximum Overdrive, which is the first one I've directed. Wow. What in the dick is going on around here? A lot of people have directed Stephen King novels and stories, and I finally decided if you want something done right, you ought to do it yourself. Who was driving it? I don't know. Curtis! It's coming after us! It was my first picture as a director. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. What is going on? I don't know! I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right. You want a war? You got one. I just want to get the hell out of here. So come and spend some time with me and my friends at the Dixie Boy. Spend some time in the dark. Please don't let us be in the dark. Help me. I'm going to scare the hell out of you. And 
That's a promise. You're going to get us in an awful lot of trouble, man. We already in trouble. Maximum Terror. <laughs> Jesus coming and he is. Maximum King. Maybe tomorrow will be our world again. Dino De Laurentiis presents <laughs> Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive. As the Earth crosses the tail of a comet, inanimate machines suddenly spring to life. An ATM insults a customer, Stephen King in a cameo, and a bridge rises during heavy traffic. At a roadside truck stop, Duncan Keller is blinded after a gas dispenser sprays diesel in his eyes. A waitress, Wanda June, is injured by an electric knife but rescued by Bill, played by Emilio Estevez, while arcade machines in the back room electrocute another victim. At a Little League game, a vending machine kills the coach and a driverless roller compactor flattens a fleeing child. Duncan's son, Deke, manages to escape on his bike. So, Gene, you mentioned in the kind of intro to the movie that this was King's first directing debut. All of his other movies had been done previously by the directors, and he always seemed to have a problem. It didn't matter if it was Kubrick doing The Shining. He would always have a fucking problem. So this is the first time that he had gotten the funding to go out and do it himself. And when you hear the trailer you just listened to, it is like, he's like, are you ready for the scariest movie ever? It's Stephen (laughs) King in the trailer talking to you. But I found myself thinking. This isn't as original as I thought when I was a kid. This is Christine on speed. This is what would happen if there were multiple Christines out there roaming around the streets. It's less original than I thought as I was as a kid. And it is no surprise that he hated his experience doing this because King did not take a traditional method of this filmmaking. The scene where the lawnmower comes out and it's chasing the kid down the street. Normally, you would say, let's take the blade off the lawnmower. This will be safer. King insisted on having the blade there because he said it would make the scene more realistic. What? The lawnmower <laughs> hit a pallet and exploded wood shards up into the director of cinematography's eyes, Armando Nanuzzi. The dude went blind and King made him come back on set two days later. So I'm not surprised this was King's last attempt at directing. Well, I mean, he's known for being remarkably self-indulgent and a huge diva. And nothing says that more than opening the movie with his own cameo. Like, who does that? I mean, can you imagine if like every Marvel movie, like the opening scene was Stan Lee? Like, it would be very, very strange. And so the fact that when he pulls his glasses off at the ATM and it's him and his terrible acting, it kind of sets the scene for what this entire movie is going to be, which is it's going to be weird. It's going to be super self-indulgent. And that Stephen King has got a lot of balls and he kind of did whatever the fuck he wanted on this film. and, And it shows. But I like that they do that opening scene because there's some mystery. Okay, what's going to happen? We know machines are going to go buck wild. They're going to start killing people. But we also find out that the alien or whatever this force is has some kind of sense of humor. There's some irony in the way they just don't want to kill people, right? They want to have fun doing it. They want to torment them. Somehow they know what fuck you and asshole means. So they're tormenting people, the ATM, tormenting King. Then you get the little kid riding down the street and the sprinklers are going off behind him. He stops, turns around. If the alien wasn't so preoccupied with trying to scare people or to set up this this ironic kill, they would have been far more effective. Big, do you remember when we did Explorers and you find out that the aliens just watch like a lot of like TV from Earth and that's what shaped their personalities? I think these aliens like watch a lot of infomercials <laughs> because, you know, in infomercials, how there's always like a single function gadget that just solves one problem, but it's a problem nobody really has. And it's never as bad as you see it in the infomercial. Like there's always that person just like fumbling through a simple task. It's like, do you, do you need to juice a lemon? You need a lemon juicer. And it's just a guy like with, uh, you know, he drops a lemon and like pops up his asshole or something, right? Maximum overdrive is 90 minutes of that. That opening drawbridge is like malfunctioning. That alone like should be terrifying. All you need to show as a director is the drawbridge goes up, cars start flying backward on the road, smashing to the ground. People are dying, right? No, no, they're not satisfied with that on maximum overdrive. You got cars that are falling through parts of the bridge that don't make sense. There's a motorcyclist that like slips through a, a crack that doesn't exist and goes flying into the water. And then it just goes worse, like axles flying off of trucks. There's a fucking watermelon flying through a moonroof. 
And then and then you move on, and the, an electric knife should not be a threat at any point in this movie, but it's sawing off arms. Dudes are spraying themselves in the eye with diesel. Like, I'm half convinced that this movie is more a message of human incompetence than machines uprising. Like, all this is shit you could just do to yourself anyway. But I have to admire the aliens again. They're setting up every scene perfectly. All the deaths are conveniently set so that someone can come by for dramatic effect. Girl dead with like hair dryer out the window and bleeding. <laughs> Other guy dead half out the window. Uh, guy in the bushes killed by some kind of lawn equipment. Leg sticking out. All the dead bodies are strategically placed. It's beautiful. It's If you want to torment a child, it's great. If you want to take over the earth, maybe not so good. Yeah, but Big D, you and I are standing here in our 40s and we're like, oh, ha, ha, this isn't scary at all. As a kid, though, oh yeah, this fucked with me. That soda machine death, like I was I remember I was 21 years old. I was in college at the life sciences building. When I go to the soda machine, I would always stand to the right of the slot when I put my money in because I was afraid <laughs> that the can was going to shoot out and, and, and hit me. And, you know. I appreciate that. Unlike Escape to Victory, like no one is safe in this movie. They don't hold back. Like if you notice when that coach got hit by the soda can, there were kids that were fucking unconscious. I presume dead. also dead. Yes. Kids are getting steamrolled. There's a fucking dead dog. Like a remote control car like flew in its mouth and killed it. It's a goddamn <laughs> bloodbath and nobody is safe. Oh, you're 100% correct. I remember poor Deke laying down. He's in like the prone position and he's like low crawling with the catcher's mask on and it's shooting him. There's a four or five kids that are already downed by these soda cans. <laughs> then the steamroller comes crushing through the, the, like the scoreboard and the fence. And it does that sound effect. I searched for it, but I couldn't find it. It's like, geek, 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 geek. and the steamroller comes and I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. You know, Deke better ride his bike away. No, it fucking crushes the skull of that kid on the ground. His head explodes like a yes. watermelon. When do you ever see kids mutilated on screen? This is only an 80s thing. Well, even the like even the electric knife that gets Wanda Jr., like how is it propelling itself toward her? It doesn't have fucking legs. Like how is it how is it moving? Right. Well, and I, I think that the elephant in the room here for me was the fact that we were doing another Emilio Estevez film and I hated on Emilio a ton in our Young Guns episode and I was absolutely dreading seeing him in this movie because he is one of my least favorite actors from this time period but I did find him to be at least slightly more interesting in this movie he's introduced us you know he's the tough guy on parole the misunderstood you know veteran and maybe it was the scruff he has maybe it was that really tiny, tiny earring that he has in his ear, his super over gelled hair, or just the fact that he's delivering lines in a way that just cracked me up. And I think it was unintentionally funny, but he's got, he's got that one line where after he basically, you know, beats the shit out of the knife and he goes, nailed it. Like It's so bad. So good. But now Ash, he's like, he's like two for two now with young guns and, and now this you know, I think Emilio Estevez might be that guy that everybody thinks they don't like, but they actually like. He's like the finger in the butt of 80s actors, right? Where you're like, I don't think I like. Well, actually. No, I tell you, this is the first time. This, I think, is Emilio Estevez. He's not that smart. He looks like he smells. He's a little <laughs> scruffy, a little dirty. And he's a great lover. I mean, he convinces her on that dirty mattress. And she says, oh, you're such a good lover. Um, this, no, no, I feel. She says. You make love like a hero. Oh, like on, the same thing. <laughs> How do you think a hero makes love? He he's probably great at it. That's why this I think is the real Emilio. And I've found myself. I'm going to cut him some more slack from here on out. Mm. Ash is right though on the hair though. Like this thing goes on for what? It's like three four days that we're watching. His hair is perfect at every scene. You know that there was an entire team devoted. It was like a NASCAR mm -hmm. pit crew just coming out because this is how you know there's a lot of attention being paid. There is the back. They show a lot of shots at the back of his head. Even that is perfectly quaffed. You could you could audibly almost hear the crunch when she caressed <laughs> his hair because of the <laughs> amount of gel that was in it. And hey, it made him look at least an inch taller. So he had that going for him. Well, a newlywed couple, Connie and Curtis, stop at a gas station where a brown tow truck tries to kill Curtis. But he and Connie escape in their car. 
Deke rides through town as humans and pets are brutally killed by lawnmowers, chainsaws, electric hair dryers, pocket radios, and RC cars. At the truck stop, a black Western Star 4800 sporting a giant green goblin mask on its grill runs over a Bible salesman after a red garbage truck kills Duncan. Later, several big rig trucks encircle the truck stop. So guys, Connie appears at this point in the movie. She's played by Yardley Smith. And I normally hate loud characters. I'm on record several times on Shatham Movies talking about how much loud 80s people in movies. I just don't think it's funny. Connie, though, she's a different breed. She's a gem. She has a terrific horror movie scream and some of the best lines in the movie, including, are you dead? And if her voice sounds familiar, Yardley Smith, who plays Connie, was the voice of Lisa Simpson on The Simpsons. But every movie that's like this, that has a stupid premise, you need Connie. Connie is the audience's surrogate. She is saying the things that we're all thinking. She's like, get in the car, stupid. When they want him to climb down into the sewer to go and save the Bible salesman, she's like, hell no, we've just been married. You ain't going to make me a widow without her. I think we would be like, why aren't people questioning this? But with Connie voicing our objections, I just realized the people at the truck stop aren't that smart. Well, no, I mean, and you left out her best line of Curtis, I don't like this. I mean, it's just absolutely (laughs) ridiculous. But I I think that we start to see some cracks here in this part of the film. And I think it's the problem that a lot of movies from the 80s and 90s and even the early 2000s have where the inanimate object is the killer, that there's something that doesn't have sentience that is the bad guy. And I think a perfect example of that is, I don't know if you guys remember that movie, The Happening, when we were supposed to be afraid of plants. And so you've got Mark Wahlberg and you've got Zoe Deschanel and they would cut just to these scenes of like grass blowing in the wind. And it was supposed to be very intimidating and it (laughs) wasn't because it's grass blowing in the wind. And you've got a movie like The Shaft, which is about a killer elevator or even King's Christine about a killer car. I think when there's no motive with these items, it becomes a problem where objects are the bad guys. It's really hard to get in there and build up some sense of real fear because it's just a lot scarier when a guy is making the choice to drive a car to run you over than it is for a, you know, a semi truck to just all of a sudden rev its engine and drive off towards you. I have to object wholeheartedly. Whole, uh- I object. That is so wrong. (laughs) Don't bring up M. Night Shyamalan's bullshit about the grass blowing in the wind and comparing that with Christine. When Christine is getting crushed and you hear the radio, people knocking, but they can't come in. I wanted to shit my pants as a kid. (laughs) That is scary as hell. I don't care. I know what the objective is. It's Christine. She wants vengeance. She is going to kill everybody. She doesn't care. That's not you can reason with a person. You can't reason with Christine. And I think the part of that is that we understand kind of what are the ground rules? What's the parameters of the power? Christine can put herself back in shape. She can paint herself. She can bring back to life. It doesn't matter as long as she has the love of her driver. But here, I don't understand. How does the comet work? Okay. Gene hinted at this, you know, (laughs) is it anything that is controlled by electricity or has a battery? But it doesn't make sense because you have the bridge. But there's something pushing the mechanical button or flipping the switch. I don't understand how that works. Yes, the lawnmower, you could start it, but what's going to drive it down the street? Or the video game that hypnotizes the guy in the arcade room and then tricks him into electrocuting himself. I don't know that they explain it well. And as I'm watching it, I'm starting to think that when this was made in the early 80s, there weren't so many things that were connected or run by technology. And the concept, I think, is great. If you made this movie in 2020, think about self-driving cars. Think about the Internet of Things. My Nest could kill me. My thermostat. I'm convinced that could kill me. Or the connected appliances, like a range. Imagine all the the Internet-connected ovens turning on and flooding a house with gas. There's so many ways that you could wreak havoc today that would be so much more terrifying. The part I don't understand is inanimate or not, there's got to be some like rhyme or reason to it. I, I like to consider myself a fairly logical person, but I'm like, okay, so what constitutes a machine? Like is a sprinkler, is plumbing a machine? 
Or does it have to be the thing that's like driving the water? Why are the controls moving? Uh, bicycles? Like Deke's riding his bicycle. That seems to be fine. Isn't that a machine? And then Curtis and Connie, they're using their car to outrun another car. Why isn't the car <laughs> not turning on them? Like other people are crashing their cars into shit. Like you said, Big D, the guy that crashed into a tree and then mysteriously hung out the window for some reason. Like why are those cars – like is it a special type of car? I, I can't figure it out. Yeah, I was really hung up on that too. And, you know, we've already talked about the difference between like battery powered versus electrical, but a perfect example are like the clocks. When you look at the clocks that are battery powered on the wall, they're all like spinning around in like these ridiculous ways, but their watches aren't doing that. Like it just, it doesn't seem to affect everything equally. And, and again, it's my adult self going, what the fuck, you know, trying to get some rhyme or reason to it. But as a kid, I never noticed any of that. I was just like, oh, look at the clock. That's really cool. You know, so. No, I get. It. I think it's the ironic comment. What it's doing is that you don't know when anything's going to turn on you. You see some things like Connie's car, but I'm going to do a little fan edit, Gene. I think the reason why Connie's car doesn't turn on them is because it's running the whole time. Maybe you have to turn it off and then it becomes possessed. Just an idea. And that brought me to a question here. Is each of these items, are they sentient? Are they one-offs? Like, is the electric knife, was that like its own kind of spirit or is there some central command? Because if there was central command, I would expect all of these electronic devices to be working together. But here it is like you, you get the one that goes down into the drainage ditch, spoiler alert, where the Bible salesman's dead. Why aren't the other ones pulling up and looking too, then chasing the kids down the culvert? So is this like a, a central command or are they each individual? I mean, they're certainly not like the Transformers, but I think that uh, I think that Stephen King didn't really think about it. And then they decided to give him his own movie. And he was like, shit. I mean, remember, he titled this thing Trucks. That's like as far as he got in the thinking. Like he just wrote it down on a napkin. It was like, yeah, yeah. OK, well, in my mind, they're all working together. So that's just that's the way I'm going on the premise. That is there a central command. And this movie, when I think everybody thinks about it and when I did is you remember the green goblin on the truck and you remember the music. And I'm convinced without the music, without ACDC being responsible for the whole soundtrack and who made who, there is no way that people are tied to this movie emotionally today because it's forgettable. If you think about the other movies that I listed, like in Cujo or, or Graveyard Shift or Silver Bullet, none of those movies had a tie-in. But when anybody hears this, the beginning of Who Made Who, you know what you're listening to. You can hate them like Carrie Gross does, but there's something about their energy that brings a movie to a different level. You can immediately connect to it. You know what they're trying to say. And this song and this soundtrack brings this movie to life to me. I'm right now, I'm like 12 years old. Yeah, no, I think right I, now you're like fucking 50 years old. I was listening to you like 49. <laughs> Why? Because he, it's fucking it's old Florida dad music. Like <laughs> fuck you. And just the way you danced just now. Fucking maximum overdrive with that Jimmy yeah. Buffett soundtrack. Oh, really kicking you. ass. Fucking fuck you. Dead. I'm gonna go down to the Cabo Wabo Cantina with my buddies and watch some football. <laughs> no, fuck you. <laughs> Well, I'll be really honest. I found the music to be pretty distracting. I think it keeps it from ever becoming like an actual horror film, if that's what they were intending. Uh, music, I think, is so inherent to horror. Like it sets the mood. It allows like this tension to build. In this movie, right, you know, the, the Green Goblin truck is revving its engine. You know, you're worried about what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, you know, instead of, you know, like some creepy music, you're like, Dad! Struck like you know, and yeah. it just doesn't like it takes you completely out of what? it. And you you laugh rather than oh like, yeah, different movie but still good. Yeah. yeah, I mean it just no, it totally totally took me out of it. Well, Connie and Curtis arrive at the truck stop and try to pass between the trucks, but their car is hit and overturns. Bill's boss Hendershot uses rockets to destroy many of the trucks. That night, the survivors hear the salesman screaming in a ditch, and Bill and Curtis sneak out to help him by climbing through the sewers. Deke finds the salesman and believes he is dead, but the salesman suddenly jumps up and attacks Deke. Bill and Curtis rescue Deke, and a truck chases them back into the pipe. <laughs> well, 
one of my favorite part of disaster and horror films are these places of convergence where people wind up. You know, you've got Dawn of the Dead with the mall. You've got The Walking Dead, which I know is a TV show. But you've got the abandoned prison. You've got The Mist with the supermarket. And then here and other Maltima movies like this one, you've got the, the consummate truck stop. And I don't think it's necessarily a terrible place to hold up. You know, you've got supplies. You've got a way to cook food. You think that they would board up those windows. I don't understand why they didn't, but you know, you think that they could do that. But I do think that it's a, a great place. You know, you've got you got all the supplies that you need, but these these people, you know, instead of counting supplies and and doing the things that they're supposed to, there's more scenes of like these bubbas sitting at the table eating lunch and like, you know, with their ketchup just like shooting the shit while they're watching these trucks run in circles. So they weren't quite taking it as seriously as maybe they should. But I I loved the truck stop scenes. Once they all got to that one place, I thought the movie was was really fun to have them all together there. There's about two thirds of the cast that is killing Miller High Life's the entire <laughs> movie. They're not pretending to care about the aliens. They're just taking this as an opportunity to drink for free. And I respect that. I mean, it makes sense. They're truckers and the threat outside is trucks. They know trucks better than anybody. Like semi trucks are great for hauling goods to market. They're giant rolling billboards. I would even venture to say they're a symbol of American industry. But what they are not good at is killing people hold up in mm-hmm. a in a truck stop if i ever wind up in a world where machines are trying to kill me i pray that they're semi trucks they have a massive turn radius so they can't really get you they need fuel to operate so they can run out and they're pretty fucking easy to spot there's not gonna be a semi truck hiding around the corner as long as you're not trying to drive through a circle of them like fucking connie and curtis you're fine yeah and also they don't accelerate very fast so it's it's not like a, a semi can surprise you. You hear it start up. It's like psh, vroom, smoke comes out. It goes into gear. You can turn around and look and go, oh, wow, it's a semi. Here it comes. I'm going to turn around and start running. You can beat it. I would be so much more afraid of smaller things. I would have been more afraid of like 60 lawnmowers. That would have scared the shit out of me or something that can swarm you like today, like some kind of drones. The big trucks, like you said, it would fall down into the cellar. All you got to do is go out into the woods, go in between a bunch of trees. It's not going to be able to get you. Yeah, or this movie vastly underused electric toys because nothing's fucking scarier than kids' toys. And they could wreak some real havoc. Like if they they run at you fast enough, I mean, they could actually really hurt people. And I, I know that you don't have kids, Gene, but I'm sure Big D can relate to this. Like when batteries get low on kids' toys, they turn on by themselves. <laughs> and so like Finn had this train that the when the batteries would get low, like at 2 a.m., all of a sudden it would go, hi, want to play with? with me and it's fucking (laughs) creepy and just that alone like the intimidation (laughs) factor of these things coming at you i think that that was sorely needed here rather than just these big ass 18 wheelers oh i totally agree so emma has this like doctor kit from dr mcstuffin it's a cartoon (laughs) where she is a a doctor for stuffed animals and it's uh, a stethoscope So when you hit it, it used to be like, how do you feel? How's your heart? It had heart rate. So now it just goes, how do you feel? (laughs) I'm like, we got to throw that shit out or change the fucking batteries. But I'm the asshole who thinks if I worked as an engineer in one of these toy companies, I think it would be funny if you programmed it. So the Teddy Ruxpin, let's say every hundred thousandth time said, your mommy doesn't love you something like that out of the blue or i'm watching you and something they couldn't replicate i think that shit would be funny am i wrong for that yeah i think you're just an asshole yeah okay yeah well that fits because i was wondering in the movie am i an asshole because when the bible salesman refuses to come inside he's seen the truck circling and they hit his caddy he's gonna go out there he gets hit down into the culvert i am not going to help him He's proven to be an asshole. He's proven to have sexually harassed my side piece now. Why am I going to risk my life to go out there? This isn't part of the ultimate mission. Well, first of all, Big D, Brett is Bill's love. He fucked her like a hero. She She's no side piece. But anyway, yeah, listen, I, I thought of this too when I was watching the movie. And then I thought about it. And I, Gene Lyons, realist. I tried to put myself in a real situation. I'm like, if I was there... 
and there was a guy and he was in, in a ditch somewhere and he was just calling out for help. You know, it'd be like, you might be able to hold out for an, like a half hour, an hour, but eventually there's a part of you, Big D. Come on, Big D super soldier. You'd go, fuck it. I got to go help this guy. No, oh, I would help anybody else. Anybody else but him. Hmm. It's it's something ingrained in you as a human being. You hear another human being in distress and you got to go home. And, and it happens in so many horror movies, you know, like like Friday the 13th. You know, it's like you hear the little kid out there that needs help. And you, it's Carrie Gross would say, help me, help me. And you got to go. You got to go check it out. You got to go help. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I I don't know if I'm brave enough to risk my life. Like, and now, now I think about everything in terms of, do I want to leave Tom in charge of my children? Like, do I want to risk not being here to raise like my fucking kids? Like, and so that's what I think about. And so I'd, I'd be fine with a guy dying if it meant I, I wasn't. But, you know, Big D, you talked a second ago about that you think this is a hive mind. Well, if it is, the hive mind's pretty fucking dumb because they've got an out here, which is the fact that these trucks run on diesel so eventually they're going to run out they they already get horrible mileage and they're just driving around this parking lot and if i'm the people in the truck stop i'm just sitting back and letting them run out of gas so for me this is a temporary problem let them run out then you're safe go about your business but this is evidence for Big D's hive mind theory because they call the the mule over to communicate with it's it's like their military and diplomatic arm, right? It shows up and it's like beep, 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 you know, using Morse code to communicate with them. It's like, listen, you pour gas or we're going to kill you. And you realize, oh, that's what they were doing the whole time. It's kind of like, Big D, remember when we did a, a Road Warrior? Yeah, exactly. And you're like, why are they driving around with gas powered <laughs> vehicles to raid a group to get their gas? It, it yeah. totally doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense at all. But rather than waiting them out, Ash, the other solution is this rocket launcher. Apparently, this M72 law that uh, the Hendershot's been hiding in his cellar, it just cannot miss. It's magically imbued, right? People are firing this thing like between their legs, over their back. They're not even aiming. And so I looked it up. And Big D, you probably know better than I do. But the the M72 law, uh, according to the research that I did, has a 25-meter back blast you can't just like shoot this thing like a fucking bb gun no so i never shot one of these laws but you do shoot or i shot an at4 which is like a shoulder mounted anti-tank weapon but you're right the back blast the last thing you do before you shoot you turn your head and you go back blast area clear that's telling everybody behind you to get the fuck out of the way because it just sprays anybody who is within 25 30 feet behind you is going to just be covered in this molten hot gas and plastic. Yeah, and to clarify for everybody, the the M72 is not a guided missile. Like it's no. a point and shoot. So like no. you have to be precise. <laughs> and they're holding this thing like down on their hip with like their hands loose. That shit is just going to shoot right out of your hands. I could imagine the actual like the the rocket launcher itself kicking back through the window and the rocket is just sitting there left on the floor in front of you. Stephen King, I know you have a lot of regrets about filming this movie, but that is a missed opportunity. That would have been the funniest fucking scene of all yes. 80 cinema if you brought out the triumphant rocket launcher, <laughs> just shot his fucking hands <laughs> through the window. Everyone gets sprayed. There's people with faces melting off. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe keep it for the remake. <laughs> the next morning, a bulldozer and an M274 mule attack the diner. Hendershot uses the rocket launcher again to blow the bulldozer away. The mule fires its post-mounted M60 machine gun into the building, killing several people. The mule then demands via Morse code that the humans pump the truck's diesel for them. The survivors soon realize they become enslaved by their own machines. Robinson suggests they escape to a local island just off the coast on which no motorized vehicles are permitted. He theorizes that the comet is actually a broom operated by aliens to destroy humanity so the aliens can repopulate the Earth. So in the midst of all this, guys, the whole crew is holed up in the truck stop. And we'd love to grumble about how horror movie characters always feel the need to shower and or fuck despite a literal massacre occurring 
all around them. You see it in horror movie after horror movie. But in Maximum Overdrive, the sex and the shower make perfect sense. You're stuck for a week. You're hiding out while machines are outside trying to kill you. But what you do have in the truck stop is hot water. You got beds, you got food, and you got a horny hitchhiker who's taller than you are. So sex is the most logical thing to do if you're Bill. Yeah, but the problem is I think the shower room is a cross where the drain is that they climb down in to go get the Bible salesman. (laughs) So you would have to be like, hey, everyone, we're going to run across the truck (laughs) circling line to go take a shower, wink, wink. So maybe they were forced to go on that gross ass mattress. But I got to respect Bill. I do, because I wouldn't have the balls to even attempt to initiate sex with someone on that mattress. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I think everybody would have sex during a crisis. And if they say they wouldn't, they're lying. I mean, look at the wave of babies that are going to be born later this year because of the start of the pandemic. I mean, we're going to have a coronavirus baby boom as opposed to the, you know, post-World War II baby boom. I think when people are stressed, they fuck. That's what they do. And I think, again, it makes total sense. But I will say I've never understood the 80s obsession with calling it making love. It always used to creep me out when I was a teenager, and it still does as an adult. Like, you know, you said she's not a side piece, but you know, they kind of did just meet and she's like, you make love like a hero and you make love like this. I mean, no, you fuck like a hero. Maybe you don't make love like one. It's just, I don't know. It's an eighties thing. I'm glad that got lost once the nineties came around. I think making love is just a term. (laughs) Mm, Making love with Mel Gibson. (laughs) That was Danny Glover. (laughs) Hey, everybody, welcome to Shot the Movies. It's time for you to get your freak on with Danny Glover. Mmm, baby. Fuck a hero. Where do we go from here? I'm done. Well, we go to the military, because that's the next uh, logical transition. But I I found myself wondering, yes, the mule, it's stupid, because it's only like one belt that's fed into this M60. You're going to burn through that shit pretty quick. But the idea is great. You want to tell the humans inside, if you don't get on board being our slaves and feeding the machines the diesel they need, we're going to come in here and we're going to just, we're going to level this building and kill you all. But I wanted to see more of that. I know we don't see anything of the destruction outside of this small truck stop. Just show me Atlanta getting nuked. Show me New York City chemical weapons. Show me just even a couple uh, attack helicopters doing strafing runs on schools, whatever. We see the kids getting run over by the, you know, the steamroller. So maybe just show us some more destruction. I love the idea that you have a military arm that could be utilized. And I just wish we'd seen something more of chemical or nuclear. Yeah. They're literally a hundred miles from Fort Bragg. Yeah. All kinds of shit could be showing up at this yeah. truck stop. You got one mule. Hey, have two or three tanks show up. A couple armored vehicles, maybe uh, just anything. Start crashing planes into buildings instead of just that Cessna hitting a school bus. And while all this mayhem is going on outside, there's the fucking mule is shooting people with a machine gun and all that. You got Brett and Billy, and they're they're laying in their dirty-ass mattress, and Billy drops this broom theory. He's like, well, yeah, you know, maybe it's like a a cosmic broom, and what it is is there's an alien race, and they want to, (laughs) like... They want no evidence, mind you. They want to uh, take over the earth. And so they're like using machines as a way to clear us out so that they can come take over. Like, how does Brett not just walk out after they make love? Like, (laughs) let's assume that there was an alien race that wanted to wipe out people and take Mm -hmm. over the planet. They've only got like eight days. Like if at this rate, they're not wiping out all of humanity. You know, like you said, Big D, they got to bring out the attack copters. They got to bring out the fucking (laughs) tanks. And you know what's deadlier to humans than a bunch of machines running amok? The fucking comet. Could you just crash the comet in the earth and kill everybody? Or maybe just some low level radiation or I don't know, aliens just show up with your own weapons and fucking wipe people out. Yeah, but I gotta I gotta roll my thought back. The reason they don't nuke or use chemical weapons or crash into the earth is they want to take over the earth. So if you're gonna go after somebody's house, your neighbor's house, a home invasion, you're not gonna burn it to the ground if you plan on living there. So that's probably why they don't. 
Right, but they could have sent some like tiny rocks or space dust like just into the well-populated areas and then moved out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it would have there were literally millions of other plans that would have worked better than a cosmic broom that is dependent upon semi trucks and other electronic devices like electronic knives and video games in order to wipe out mankind. <laughs> yeah, I was really hoping that Billy was just way off on this theory. Like he was just fucking nuts and everyone watching goes, oh. This guy's no, no. Fucking clue he's talking about. But I'd definitely be getting up and getting out of bed. Uh, no, you got to think of it. Billy is the smartest guy there. He's the Einstein of the truck stop. Who else is smarter than him? You think Brett? Brett's been drifting across the country. She's trying to go down south. She may be street smart, but she does. She'd be like, okay, the comet, yeah, whatever. She's not that bright. But Billy, he comes up with some ideas that everyone treats him like he is this great strategic mind. He says, you know what? We're all going to do, okay? There's this island out there that has no machinery on it at all. Okay, that's great. You got a good idea there, Billy. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a sailboat because a sailboat does not have engines. And we're going to sail the six miles out to this island. (laughs) What are you fucking thinking about? Yes, your sailboat doesn't have an engine. But what about all the damn jet skis, all the other boats, all the other military vehicles, submarines? The water would be teeming with gas engine vehicles that are just waiting for your slow ass sailboat to come out there. This is not a good idea. Just go out into the woods, go out into a big mature pine forest, anywhere that vehicles can't come in and hit you. You would survive much longer than the open water where you're almost guaranteed to drown in the middle of the ocean when a jet ski rams you. See, I mean, this is why I would never survive long term in these situations, because I was going, yeah, it's a great fucking idea. Let's do it. Let's get on a sailboat. I mean, I've always said that if there's, you know, well, when the impending zombie apocalypse happens, that the first thing I'm going to do is head out into open water. And I applied the same logic here. But I have to tell you, uh, you're right. I would have died. I would have (laughs) drowned. Well, during a fueling operation, Bill sneaks a grenade into the mule vehicle and leads the party out via a sewer hatch just as the trucks demolish the entire truck stop. The survivors are pursued to the docks by the Green Goblin truck, which kills Brad, the trucker. Bill destroys the truck with a rocket. Mm -hmm. The survivors then sail off to safety. A title card epilogue explains that two days later, a UFO was destroyed by a Soviet weather satellite, in quotes, Conveniently equipped with a class four nuclear missile and a laser cannon. Six days later, the Earth passes out of the comet's tail and the survivors are still alive. So I want to rewind a bit to this fueling operation thing. (laughs) There's this weird part where like everyone's like falling over from exhaustion. Billy's got like blisters all over his hand. They've been driven to near death by the incredible physical exertion of <laughs> of pumping gas. It's about the lowest effort work I can I can think of. And at this point, if you're doubting at all that this is supposed to be a comedy and not a horror movie, consider Billy like they they make him out to be like a drug dealer for these trucks now. He he literally leans into a truck and he's like, "Hey man, I got the mm. best shit on the East Coast. It's practically uncut." And I'm like, "Oh, okay. This isn't supposed to be scary at all." Gene, you're not seven years old anymore. See this movie as a comedy and you'll enjoy it a heck of a lot more. But I love the way the trucks respond. When he says like a joke, it's like, brum, brum. <laughs> like the truck is like almost laughing. Well, and speaking of drugs, I think I have a reason why this movie kind of goes off the rails so totally toward the end. Uh, King was dealing with massive addiction issues in the 80s. He was really into coke there for a little while. And right about the time that this movie was written and produced, and it makes sense because this is that type of movie that I feel like you're like sketching out or like he's writing his story trucks and he's like, dude. This is going to be a great fucking film. <laughs> and everybody around him that's super high, like, you know, do a line and they're like, man, that fucking sounds great. Like, let's do it. it. Let's get out there. Right. Like, you write it in like six hours. And I think that the movie would be a lot more enjoyable on drugs. And I think that that also, though, is the same reason why this movie doesn't have the same level of thought maybe put into it that other King stories did. Because he got clean pretty soon thereafter um, of finishing this film and his other movies and books. There were bit more thought out and not quite as frenetic because drugs are bad kids i don't know ash i was pretty fucking lit when i watched this movie and i still was not having a a great time this time around 
Well, yeah, I wasn't coked up, but I mean, right. when I'm drunk, I like most things. Like you could mm-hmm. present me with 90% <laughs> of scenarios and I'd be like, fucking all right, like right, let's go. And, and even in my hazy brain state, I noticed on that title card epilogue, I was like, that's a fucking lot to include in a title <laughs> co- card. Like maybe just show us some of that alien action instead of an hour of trucks circling a gas station. Like there's aliens in the comet. That'd be kind of cool to see. Or like fucking, I don't know, like some sort of insidious view from outer space or, or just, you know what, Stephen King, you don't have to explain yep. why the machines were coming to life. Like it could just be a thing that was just happening. And, and we're left to wonder, like, we don't, we don't even need to include that. Instead, you look like an idiot. It's like a 12 year old wrote this movie. I, I agree. I think you screw it up at the end. Mystery, leave it open ended. Think of the end of the thing. We don't know. Were any of the two survivors, were they the thing? Did it actually make it back to civilization? But even the thing fucked up because they opened with this with the scene with the, the UFO <laughs> in it. Like, don't show me the UFO. And then I'm like, I don't know what's going on. It's just weird shit. Uh, that, that's fine. But the ending with that car did seem like an add-on. It seemed like almost like they tested it and it didn't test well without explaining what was driving the comet and what was behind it. But it doesn't make sense to me because they're stupid aliens. It, it, they have to be the dumbest aliens out there, right? Because somehow a Russian weather satellite that is equipped with a laser and class four nuclear weapon isn't a satellite, some kind of electronic (laughs) equipment. Wouldn't the aliens, the first thing they do is be like, hey, guys, listen, there's these these satellites right around us. They might spot us. Let's take them over and crash them and then go over the planets. How are they surprised by these satellites that were a, a couple hundred feet away? When you'd think the satellites would be the first thing that they would affect because they're orbiting the yeah. Earth. So you'd right. think that they would, you know, get them on their side first. So I agree. Not not really well thought out. But I will say that this movie, you know, at the end, Stephen King, if you're familiar with any of his works, he loves a good theme, right? Like he and he's always very heavy handed in the presentation of that theme. So you've got, you know, it about how adults don't understand kids and overcoming childhood fears to one of my favorites, the mist, where like a literal mist clouds our judgment and separates us. And so King's always got this lesson that he wants us to learn. And I think that's pretty clear that Maximum Overdrive is silly of a movie as it is. It's all about this over-reliance on technology. And I do think that with them talking about a 2020 remake, I think that would make the remake a lot more interesting. Because in watching this, it's almost laughable to think about 1986 for us to have a quote-unquote over-reliance on technology, because it was nothing compared to what we've got today. It was almost like, oh, that's so cute, you know, that they like their cars and their video arcades when, (laughs) you know, now like I can't survive if I've got multiple pieces of tech with me. And and so I, I do think that a 2020 film would be more interesting and maybe even scarier in this whole maximum overdrive scenario than, than what we got here. I couldn't agree more, Ash. And that brings us to our wipe score. So if you never listened to the podcast before, the chat score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your Bum, a zero wipe is pure, uncut diesel. It is the cleanest shit you can get on the East Coast. And a five wiper is a Bible salesman in a ditch covered in sewage with food and Miller High Life still in his mustache. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Maximum Overdrive? So this is actually going to be the first time that my wipe score does not reflect my level of enjoyment of the film, because I loved watching this movie. I still thought it was really fun. It made me laugh a lot more than some of the comedies that we watch on this show, because it is so ridiculous. You can't help but love a lot of it. But my enjoyment does not necessarily mark a good movie because when we look at, you know, is this a good film? Well, it's actually pretty shitty for a lot of it. It makes absolutely no sense. It's incredibly self-indulgent. It drags a little bit. The acting is just horrendous without intending to be horrendous. So I'm going to say it's a one white for enjoyment, but the movie itself, I'm saying it's a 3.5. All right, this three and a half wipes from Ashley Schlafly. I'm right about there with you, Ash. No surprises. We are a hive mind. But watching <laughs> Maximum Overdrive made me realize just how good Tremors was. Mm. Like, if you think about it, both are set in a small, isolated town. Both have this 
host of Ding Dong Hee Haw characters both had this one note, utterly improbable threat that makes no scientific sense. But somehow Tremors kept everything fresh and interesting and exciting, while Maximum Overdrive, to me, it felt like it ran out of ideas in the first 30 minutes. Still, as you said, Ash, it's fun, it's quotable, it's unique. And more than anything, it's a movie that everyone remembers. And those 30 minutes I did enjoy, I really, really enjoyed. So for me, it's a three wiper. How about you, Big D? So I'm I'm struggling here. And I am self-aware. Okay. I understand that my nostalgic view and memory of this movie is uh, it's affecting my score, but I can't help it. I have to be genuine. I think this is a two white movie. It is slightly better than average. Is it a great movie? No, but you got to think of the audience back in 86. This was for a younger audience who wanted to be afraid of the newly really developing electronics and computers, and they didn't know what was possible. Uh, A lot of the kills are campy, but that's what we wanted back then. I had a great time watching it. The soundtrack is killer, and it is a movie that people will remember today. If you talked about Cat's Eyes, Like People would be like, what the hell is that? Or Silver Bullet, people wouldn't even. If you show the Green Goblin truck or play Who Made Who, people will remember it. So there is a reason that this is ingrained in the kids of the 80s and 90s and even today. So I think it is successful for that. So damn beat a logic. This is a two white movie for me. And with that score, I think that comes out to a combined wipe score of 2.83. And that means that this movie now is tied in the 116 spot with Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Air Force One, and Grease 2. Oh, my God. (laughs) Fucking, you really? Yeah, At least it's a little worse than Blade Runner. If this was better than Blade Runner, we'd have just, all the machines would come to life and they would just just kill us. Fucking Grease 2 is such a better movie than this. No, no way. No, you Whatever. can't you can't compare Cool Rider to this. Seriously. I'm gonna disagree with you there. <laughs> Not just Cool Rider, but reproduction. <laughs> I'll be your girl for all season. No. So much better than any A C D C song ever. No, you're just you're, you're flat out wrong. You're just flat out wrong. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Two point eight three repeating wipes for maximum overdrive the chat hath spoken thank you so much to richard m for commissioning this film big d what do we have coming up next so next two weeks we have something very special it is a historic moment in chat the movies so i'm going to read you the description but i'm not going to pretend like you don't know what it is uh gene and i did raiders of the lost ark way back probably about two years ago now So George P. commissioned the adventure prequel. The intrepid archaeologist Indiana Jones is on the trail of fortune and glory in old Shanghai, is ricocheted into a dangerous adventure in India. With his faithful companion Short Round and nightclub singer Willie Scott, Indy goes in search of the magical Shankara stones to uncover an ancient evil that threatens all who come in contact with it. So next week we will be doing the Temple of Doom. The Mm -hmm. following week, we will be doing Indiana Jones and the last crusade. So we will complete our first trilogy of films. We're all going to pretend like the fourth one, the crystal skull did not happen. I have a confession to make everyone, which might make this a little more fun for the listeners. I've never seen any of these movies. (gasps) None. None. What? I mean, I've seen Raiders. We covered the movies, but I've never seen these movies. Spoiler alert, Temple of Doom is my favorite. So I I can remember the theater I saw it in, the seat I was in, how I felt walking into that movie. This was a pivotal moment in my youth. Yeah. I can't believe you haven't seen it. That's gonna make for a good commission because this is a great it, I'll tell you, it's not what you expect. It's not, hey, let's have fun, Indiana Jones. This one with the Nazis, this one gets a little darker. Well, the Temple of Doom's not the Nazis. Yeah, there's no Nazis. No, I was, saying, I was saying the first You've one. You've never seen Kali Ma? Dude, there's, I've seen there's, that scene, yeah. There's Kali human Ma. sacrifice. There's child slave labor. This is some dark shit. It's going to be good. 
It's All right. Great. Well, I look forward to it. So thank you, George P. for commissioning that. Thank you, Richard M. for commissioning Maximum Overdrive. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us at host at shatthemovies.com. You can support us by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website at shatthemovies.com. Another way you can support us is on Twitch. If you go to shatthemovies.com slash Twitch, you can subscribe using your Amazon Prime membership. And that actually kicks a couple bucks to the podcast every month and doesn't cost you anything. It's included in your Prime uh, subscription. So even if you don't want to watch this on Twitch, that's fine. Just go subscribe. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shout on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. You can find all that information on our website, shatontv.com, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review with very kind things to say about me, Big D, and Ash, and fuck it, and the King B as well. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, Ashley Schlafly, and the King B, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. If adventure has a name, it must be Indiana Jones. From Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Indiana Jones. And the Temple of Doom. You don't believe me. You will, Dr. Jones. (laughs) 